Welcome, everybody, to this weekly broadcast. I'm your host, R. Christian Minson. Breathwork edition here. This week, we come to you every, every week live, but this week we're talking about the topic, Big Kids Do Cry. I am a certified transformational breath facilitator, been doing breathwork uh, training, facilitating all over the world for the last 13 years. I've been all over the place. I was a director, breathwork director at Rhythmia Life Advancement Center in Guanacaste, Costa Rica for a couple years. And I was a monk for 10 years prior to that as well. So I've got a well-rounded a history of all sorts of stuff done and today uh, all of that gets put into the the topics that we're speaking on today's topic is big kids do cry we're really looking at the role of not just crying but all of our emotions in our lives though the crying seems to be one big one that really uh, you know that that people identify with either identifying that they can't do it or identifying that yeah, let the floodgates open. So I'm hoping by the end of this we can really see why it's important to let those floodgates open up. And again, if you're here, if you want to say hi, you want to you want to say anything, have any uh, comments or questions, type them in the chat bar, and we'll get to them along the way. So why are we doing this topic today? You know, emotions are an integral part of our life experience. We have a physical body, a mental body, and ultimately emotional body, and spiritual bodies. And all of these we need to develop equally. We need to develop them in balance. Now, we need to balance them because the, the chain of our, our strength, our strength in life, is basically only as strong as the weakest link. So the, the weakest body is is our Achilles heel, so to speak. And for many people, that is our emotional body. Uh, you know, we're taught, don't cry, keep a stiff upper lip, don't show your anger, don't, don't be so loud and happy, even, you know, all of these attitudes really do one thing. They stunt our emotional growth, our emotional intelligence. And, uh, you know, emotional intelligence. I've done I've done some talks on emotional intelligence in the past, and in researching it, it's it's shown that our emotional intelligence is a higher factor in the success of people in life over their intellectual intelligence, over the connections they have, over anything else. It is emotional intelligence which uh, which ensures success more than any of these other factors. So let's get into it. Storing this emotional energy is can can lead to physical dysfunction. It's it's an energy that our emotions are emotion, energy in motion. And they need to move. If they don't move, we keep them trapped inside. They're trying to move and they're wreaking havoc on our internal system. And that can cause chronic physical pain, an inability to enjoy life. Uh, a real sense of moodiness that that's really happened to me in the past sexual dysfunction disconnection from others and ultimately disease stress and death so it's a serious topic and we want to see how we can liberate these emotions and what we can really what we can really do about it and I've got a story from my own life to really illustrate it today this is uh, a fun one Anybody out there saying hi? Keep keep uh, keep up with the comments there. All right. So, what is what is this topic uh, about emotions? Emotions are really the color of life. Yeah, like if you were to watch TV in black and white, right? And then all of a sudden somebody said, "Hey, I got a new color TV." Does anybody remember black and white TV? That's I know a few people on here would remember that, but. I don't know that they even have black and white TVs these days, but TV in black and white, there's something missing. There, there's some jazz pizzazz. And they came out with Technicolor, and all of a sudden, all the colors of the, the rainbow could be experienced. And the, so the story took on a new life, a new vitality. And this is the same thing with our emotions. Imagine you're a painter, and you know your emotions are each of the colors of the palette. And you don't want to 
you don't like some of them. So you don't want to use blue and red and, and yellow. You only want to use brown and black. And just imagine how uh, boring that painting can be, unless you're really a monochromatic type of painter and that's your, your stick. But, you know, imagine then you bring all those other colors in, those other emotions in, and then start to paint how much more vivid, how much more alive that painting would become. So we're limiting our experience by limiting our emotional expression, by choosing that some emotions are okay to express and some aren't, and we should would hide them in the back. Uh, emotions are really messengers. They're deliverers of information in our lives, information that's vital to us navigating our life. Imagine that your emotions are like letters in the mail, for instance. <clears throat> you get a bunch of letters in the mail, you get one, you get a letter from a friend, that's the happy emotion. You, you, get, a let, you get a bill, and that's a, that's a sad or angry emotion, right? And you don't want to read that, so you don't, you don't. Only then, two weeks later, you find that your lights are shut off. <clears throat> so the message in that bill was an important and vital message, but if you don't read it, you don't get the message, and it doesn't, and then your life has negative consequences as a result. So the same thing with the emotions of like the bill was representing anger or sadness. These emotions that, you know, if you try to avoid them, if you try to get away from them, you're, you're not receiving the message that they have for you, and then that's going to help you steer your life in a better direction. Right? Now, uh, the other thing that's, that's important to understand is that our heart communication is much more intuitive and uh, it, it's more in direct connection with our soul whereas our mind our intellect is is learned information it, it's it is it's our school book learning basically and the mind is easily fooled whereas the emotions the heart is a lot harder to, to fool and this is you know this is what's so hard when, when people do what's called like gaslighting and stuff you're your inner being knows when somebody's not telling you the truth, but they're acting, their words, their intellect, you know, they're trying to appeal to your intellect and saying, no, the situation's this way. And so your mind's saying, okay, well, they make sense and all this, but your heart's saying, no, no, no. But if you let the heart win, I mean, the mind win, which is essentially what often happens because our hearts aren't, uh, aren't fully expressed, that then we get ourselves into trouble. So, uh, you know, imagine here in, to compare, pretend our, our intellect and our, our emotional abilities are like internet uh, service, all right? So it's internet service to your house, to you. The information is coming to you. From your mind, it's like the information is coming on a DSL cable, you know, a physical cable that's capable of, let's say, I don't know what the exact uh, megabytes per second, but say 100 megabytes per second. A significant, you know, on the upper ends of our, our DSL cable, we can, we can bring in 100 megabytes per second of information. So that's a significant amount. But then when you think about your emotions, your emotions are like bringing that information in on a fiber optic cable. Now, fiber optic cable is capable of bringing in upwards of 100 gigabytes per second of information. That's, I don't know, 100 times more, 1,000 times more than uh, the, the 100 megabytes. Somebody who knows that math, tell me what it is. Significantly more, exponentially more information can be received in each second through our emotional capacities than our intellectual capacities. To put this into a real life example, imagine you've gone to a party, and you've probably even experienced this before. You go to a party, somebody you don't know, you walk in the door, your mind is immediately starting to scan. It's like, all right, there's some guys at a keg over there, there's some, some girls hanging out in the corner, there's a hot tub in the pool, and there's this, and what, you know, trying to assess, is this place good for me? Am I gonna like this? Whereas the heart, Goes, goes out there and comes back and instantaneously it feels it and it says, this isn't the place for you. This is, there's something, something strange about this. Get out of here. And so if you're listening to your heart, you turn around. If you listen to your head, it's like, yeah, 
I haven't seen anything out of sorts yet. Let's go in. And then you end up getting into trouble. All right. So this is, these are, you know, illustrations of, of how important it is to really cultivate and be aware and be expressive on that emotional level because it's, you know, it's the color of life. It's communication that we otherwise wouldn't receive if we're not open to those emotions. And it's a communication channel that's so much more vast and, and, and uh, expedient than our intellectual channel. All right, so, you know, so here's where I want to get, I want to tell my story, basically. Uh, I, you know, all my life, I'd say one of my main missions in life, well, one of my, uh, my own personal journeys has been to gradually learn myself to get in touch with my emotions, to actually feel them, ultimately to express them. And it's, it's been a, a lifelong journey and it wasn't very good in the beginning. And this is why I'm such a, a champion now of anybody who, who I see struggling to feel, struggling to express their feelings. I really want to be there to, to encourage them to do so um, because of my own past experience and how difficult it has been for me <clears throat> in the past and still. Still working on it, uh, have made great um, gains and strides. It's improved my relationship and my relationships uh, tremendously as a result because relationships are built on feeling each other, right? Well, so here's my story. I, I, uh, I was born into a military family and you know, I can remember back when I was five years old-ish, so, you know, somewhere in there, I was playing on the floor, something happened, I started to cry. And my dad, who'd had a long day or whatever, didn't have a lot of patience. And he came over to me and with a hand kind of high in the air, he said, you want to cry? I'll give you something to cry about and was ready to swap me. I'd uh, seen that hand before and knew, uh, knew what contacting me felt like. So I jumped up and I ran down the hall, locked myself in the bathroom, and there I was crying crying my eyes out in the bathroom, locked in so nobody could get me. My dad came to the door, shaking the door. He said, hey, bang, come out of there. Big boys don't cry. And I wouldn't have any of it. I just kept bawling and bawling. You know, uh, it had unlocked something in me. Finally, he got frustrated and left. And I, you know, I continued to cry until it petered out. I felt safe enough to unlock the door and, you know, run to my room. And, and that was the end of the situation. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression of, of thinking that my father was a monster or any kind. He was just brought up uh, like many men of his generation, generation prior to mine, that where, you know, the it wasn't kosher to express your emotions. It, you know, to be, especially in the military, to be a stoic individual, to be be strong and and a fighting machine, you have to put your emotions in the closet. I mean, who can kill another human being if you're actually feeling what you're doing, right? Uh, not that he killed a lot of human beings either. Um, in fact, none, I, I believe. Um, so, but the me mentality that they had can be summed up in, in four words. Big boys don't cry. And those words were etched in my consciousness through my experience of growing up. You know? And like most young males of this westernized society, it became the guiding principle that not only characterized the relationship with my father, but with all of my relationships, my friends, my family, my girlfriends, all that. They were suppressed, sedated, and emotionless. In other words, I became the dry-eyed poster child for big boys don't cry. So, which made it all the more perplexing when I found myself about 30 years later bawling my eyes out in the church, in the pews of a church on, ironically, a Father's Day Sunday service. Now, just 20 minutes earlier in the, in the service, uh, I was doing everything I could not to listen to the minister because he was very monotone and pretty boring. Uh, in fact, I was trying to 
think instead of how I could get out to be the first one in line for the potluck afterwards and get my plate all filled up. But uh, as I was pondering this, I was wholly unprepared what was to come next because the what this minister did at this point would change the way I viewed my life, my emotions, and my relationship with my father forever. Uh, the minister came out. He said, the relationship with your father is not always easy. Amen to that, right? He said, he can often be very exacting and critical. He's like, yeah, he's speaking my language. He said, but that doesn't mean that your father doesn't have a love for you deep down inside. I was like, hmm, really? You don't say. So he said, since it's Father's Day, I'd like to end by reading a poem that was written uh, by a father to his son who was overseas in World War II. And this expresses the sentiment of a father very well. So I said, okay, let's hear it. So he began, he pulled out the, the poem from his, his jacket and he began to read it. He said, you know, son, it's a funny thing how close a war can really bring a father who for years with pride has kept his emotions deep inside. Now I find myself all of a sudden strangely connecting with this poem, with the minister out loud that it was, you know, my father was in the military. His father was a military man. He kept his emotions deep inside, like this, this father was expressing. And I had to wonder, could, could my father ever express this way? And then the minister continued. I'm sorry, son. When you were small, I let reserve build up a wall. I told you real men never cried. And it was mum who always dried your tears and smoothed your hurts away so that you soon went back out to play. Now the usher next to me, as I glanced over, was already reaching for the Kleenex, and in my judgmental mind, I was like, what a crybaby, man. But I have to admit, I noticed that my eyes were feeling a little watery themselves, which I attributed to the pollen in the air, so it's so all good, right? It's all good. But the minister continued with the next verse. He said, but son, deep down within my heart, I long to have some little part in drying that small tear-stained face. But we were men, and men don't embrace. Now at this point, alarm bells started going off in my head. Me, 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 emotion alert, emotion alert. All hands on deck, full feeling meltdown. I started to feel it inside. I was caught experiencing a torment behind these words because I could see it from both sides of the perspectives. First, from the child secretly yearning to have this kind of emotional connection with my father. But second, from the, from the perspective of the father, uh, you know, and all fathers, all men who feel trapped by this indoctrination of this stoic definition of what it means to be a man in suppressive denial of the emotions that make us human, right? And let's see, and Jerry's saying, definitely important to express our feelings without judgment towards ourselves. Amen to that, brother. So the minister concluded the poem at this point. He said, well, somehow pride and what is right have changed their places here tonight, and I find my eyes won't stay quite dry, and that men sometimes really do cry. Well, at this point, I could forget the potluck. I got up with as much composure as I could and beelined it to the bathroom where I made up my way to a stall, closed and locked the door just in time for torrents of tears to start running down my face. I mean, I was a mess, blubbering mess, just crying, bawling it out. And there I was once again, a five-year-old boy crying in the bathroom. Now, I don't know how long it it was that it, that it took, but it's this catharsis of emotion happened. Finally, the tears stopped flowing. I unlocked myself from the stall. I got out, went to the sink, splashed water on my face, looked in the mirror and looked into my eyes. And I was mesmerized by what I saw, this 
the sense of transformation, the sense of an, a new connection to myself that hadn't been present before. So I went to dry off and then I realized there weren't any paper towels. So I had to stick my face under that air blower, you know, to get it all dry. It wasn't a pretty sight. So, you know, to conclude this whole thing, I cried that day because it was a release, you know, a release of years of emotion that had been locked up inside of me. I cried that day as well out of compassion, compassion for this father who you know, was expressing his emotion to his son, compassion for my father, and again, for all men and ultimately their loved ones who find themselves locked behind this prison of self-imposed emotional indifference. And then I cried that day out of hope. Hope for a society, our Western society, that runs dangerously close to becoming too detached from our feelings and ultimately then from each other. You know. But the hope was there that if one man who expressed his feelings could, could cause me to start to feel again, that maybe if I express my feelings uh, and any one of us through our own expression could help be a catalyst to break all men and essentially all humans free from their emotional shackles. So, you know, maybe it's true that big boys don't cry because in my experience I've seen that for this kind of maturity, maturity of expression to take place, it takes from going from a boy to becoming a man. And so, so that really is the expression of, of my personal journey uh, of really from it was that was really the turning point for me where uh, you, you know I could literally say before that point I probably cried two times in ten years and then since then uh, I've I've worked it up and now and in, uh, in my current relationship I I cry about every week um, Fortunately, they're more like happy tears. Uh, it's not, I have a wonderful relationship, so don't, that's not what I'm saying. But I've learned to, to be not only, at first it was kind of timid. I start to cry and be like, is anybody around? And then, uh, then it got to be where I'd like watch commercials on TV. Like when the Olympics came out, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, something, to me so so grand you know there's this grandeur to the Olympics and they they spotlight some of the some of the Olympians and how they went from from nothing to working hard and now they're together with their team and they're gonna make it and you know just passionate just start start the tears flowing and now I actually um, can be I'm actually happy and proud if I can cry and there's other people around. I don't mind at all, and I feel like it's now actually an invitation. It's an example. I'm setting an example for others to, to do the same. And this is what's got me into the work that I have done because my work is largely about helping people unlock old emotional garbage and bringing, uh, bringing that out so that they can start this flow of emotion and, and energy in their life again which all I can say from my experience is it's made life a hundred times more beautiful, a hundred times more exciting, and a uh, and and hundred times more colorful. And as we're here, Jessica is saying thanks for sharing your story. Uh, thank you. Tammy is saying thank you for sharing. Uh, and Jerry is saying heart open goodness. Yeah, right on. And, uh, you know, so how do we do this ourselves And that you know, I was just saying my work that I do is really the the next step in this this whole Facebook Live is really to say how we can express our emotions better. Breath work is one of the the most fantastic modalities for bringing up uh, for for regaining our emotional body and our our emotional capabilities. In fact, it was. It was breathwork that actually helped me as well after, after uh, well, it was before this experience. It, it kind of got me, primed the pump, so to speak. It was my first 
my first breathwork seminar where I really learned that first of all, as I was doing the breathwork, that that the energies that were coming up were actually feelings. You know, for so long I'd stuffed this energy down that I wasn't even aware of a lot of the nuances of feeling. So I started to identify these feelings. Then it gave me the capacity and a safe space, and this is what I really create in my work, to express those feelings, to, to not feel sheepish or shy, but just to let those feelings out. But the ultimate thing that Breathwork has done and does for everyone that I they work with is it gives you a way to integrate that old suppressed energy, meaning we don't just bring that energy up and feel our feelings and then let it go back down. But we bring that energy up to release it, to finally bring it to completion, to, to work out. Most of the time, the experiences of our lives just need to be uh, expressed. And that in the time that, that we were having them, you know, big boys don't cry, so you have to suppress that, that crying. And, but it's inside and it's unresolved and it keeps wanting to come out and it's going to keep you know it will go in cycles it'll go dormant don't come back up and say well you express me now and you're like no no stuff it down smoke some weed do some drink drink yourself to oblivion you know numb yourself out do whatever so you don't have to feel it and then eventually it comes back up we express me now and that's going to keep happening and it's uncomfortable every time until you finally let it out and uh, what i can say about breath work is that it helps you let it out much quicker and much more gently than if you were left to your own devices. And so, uh, so really think about if if emotional expression is something that's on uh, on your list to to embody and do better in your life. Think about looking into breathwork. Give me a contact. Uh, let me know uh, what you're looking for, and I can guide you and steer you in the right direction. I was looking in, Andrea Berry is uh, on. Good for you, good to see you. Did you Did you hear the whole story? I wonder, were you, have you been on the whole time? Welcome, welcome, welcome. So, you know, the breath work helps you to let go of the resistance that, you know, there's this resistance, this, this block, you know, the blocked emotions are just our resistance to feeling. And we've, we've learned that. We've learned that by observing the others in our environment, largely our parents, our teachers, our friends, our, our you know, the people we look up to. And when we see that, uh, you know, the classic, say, Marlboro man, right, he's out there on his horse smoking his cigarette, stern look, and all by himself, you know, he's a self made man, and he's not going to show emotion for, for anything, right? Because why should he cry? He's too tough. Um, you know, that's, that paradigm is just breaking down and it's caused a lot of problems in our society and in most of our personal lives. So let's, let's be emotionally intelligent. Let's say that emotions are part of our makeup. Emotions are, are there to be expressed and to be felt. I think maybe one of the, one of the, why people are reticent to express their emotions is we see some people who, who emotions overtake them, right? That, that they're just overly emotional. And that's, uh, that's an extreme too. So on one side we have the extreme of not expressing your emotions, being stoic. The other extreme is to let your emotions control your life. And, and this isn't really what I'm saying when I'm talking about expressing your emotions. Both extremes need to come into what we always call the golden middle path where we have a healthy relationship to our emotions, we can express them, and yet they don't end up getting the better of us. And that, it's important to understand that if we express our emotions regularly and healthfully, they don't build up and, and then become this catastrophic force that wreaks havoc in our lives. Okay, so just think, what if you allowed your emotions to flow without suppression or without judgment. You know, how would your life be different? Maybe you feel a little self-conscious at first, but you know, as you go on expressing those emotions, you experience 
the richness of life. You probably start feeling a bit healthier, even a bit happier, even if the emotions you express were sadness. After the expression, there's this, you know, it's like rain, you know, rains and rains, and then the rain stops, the sun comes back out, there's this, you know, there's the atmosphere is nice and clear, all the dirt from the, the air has is, is gone to the ground, and there's a freshness, there's the negative ions in the air. So, you know, this is our internal environment after a good cathartic expression of emotion. You know, you probably feel less pain, uh, you know, able to enjoy life more, become more intuitively aware, make better choices, and ultimately be more aligned with who you truly are. So this is what I'm hoping for you. This is what I want to encourage for all of you out there. Again, if there's anything I can do as, uh, you know, in my work as a breath worker, as a spiritual life coach, help guide you on that way please feel free to reach out if you like this video please share it um, please click like um, please subscribe to my channels my Facebook my YouTube Instagram all that kind of stuff stay in touch so that we can ride this wonderful emotional journey of life together With that namaste until next time and then as I always promise, hey, Marbe Randaka Tosaro came and you like? Does that mean you like this topic? So come on in, as I always promise, as I promised in the beginning, for those who were on the beginning, I have this guitar here for a reason. <clears throat> I'm going to play a song today that I, I always try to play a song that is in alignment with the topic. Uh, and since this one is big kids do cry I thought I would sing cry baby cry which is a Beatles song written by John Lennon uh, I learned a song years ago probably 30 years ago and probably haven't played it for at least 20 years uh, until uh, just prior to this I pulled it out uh, it, it was the best best fit for the topic so let's see let's see if we can do it all right Please excuse if I don't get all the chords right this time, but it's ready. Cry, baby, cry. Make your mother sigh. She's old enough to know better. So cry, baby, cry. The king of Marigold was in the kitchen cooking breakfast. The queen, the queen was in the parlor playing piano for the children of the king. Cry, baby, cry, make your mother sigh. She's old enough to know better, so cry, baby, cry. The king was in the garden picking flowers for a friend who came to play. The queen was in the playroom painting pictures for the children's holiday. Cry, baby, cry. Make your mother sigh. Old enough to know better, so cry, baby, cry. The Duchess of Cacoli, always smiling and arriving late for tea. The Duke was having problems with a message at the local Burnaby. Cry. Baby, cry, make your mother sigh. She's old enough to know better. So cry, baby, cry. Twelve o'clock, a meeting round the table for your 
Especially by the children for a long cry, baby, cry. Make your mother sign. She's old enough to know better. So cry, baby, cry. Cry, cry, baby. Make your mother sign. Old enough to know better, so cry, baby, cry. Go, cry your heart out. You got permission. Got permission from me. You don't need permission. Just go do it. If you're feeling it, express whatever emotions you got there. The healthiest way to live. The healthiest way to be. So until next time. Our Christian Minson signing off. See ya. Namaste.